uh, our motivation is to enhance averaging. You know, averaging is an approximate tool, right? And it works for high enough frequency, and we don't know how high the frequency should be. So uh, we need a, a better approximation that works not only for order epsilon. So it gives you a solution that is order epsilon around the exact solution. And uh, like I said, uh, if epsilon is too small, then the approximation is good. But we need higher order approximation. We need higher order averaging. So you can do this uh, one of two ways. There is a way using the classical perturbation theory. No geometric control, no differential geometry. Very appealing to engineers. And is led by Naifei and others. He has his books on perturbation theory and nonlinear dynamics and made several contributions to this field. I will not go through this, you can read it on your own. It's typically taught in a course in perturbation. Professor uh, Sereniano is teaching the course in perturbation, usually. And it's also typically taught in, uh, in a course in nonlinear dynamics. Unfortunately, we don't have a course in nonlinear dynamics, the classical nonlinear dynamics. The other way is using chronological calculus, which has to do with abstract math, differential geometry. It's not that hard, but it's mathematically appealing. Engineers may favor this route. Mathematicians will definitely favor this route. So uh, this is our topic today, chronological calculus. It's uh, by a paper, like I said last time, by Agrachev and Gamkerlitz. Students of Pontryagin. The paper is 1978. It's a very fundamental paper. And yet, it's 200 citations only so far, because it's very hard to read. The paper name is Exponential Representation of flows and the chronological calculus. Like I said last time, they wrote this paper in the honor of 70th birthday of their advisor, Lev Semenovich Pontria, the founder of optimal control theory, one of the finest mathematicians in the century. So, um, chronological calculus is a calculus for time varying systems. Time varying, the, the most general, nonlinear time varying systems. Doesn't matter. Vector fields, you can say vector fields or systems, you know that systems are represented by vector fields. Yeah, it is pretty simple, and actually, when you take your time to digest it, it doesn't look as hard as the paper may show. So here is, let's have some, you know, exposition here. I have LTI, our paradise, x dot equals a of x. We know the solution. It's exponential, acting linearly on x naught, right? Where e to the a t is identity plus a times t plus s squared t squared over 2 and so on. So first of all I can do this with matrices. can multiply so it's well defined. Uh, and you have to worry about convergence because it's an infinite series and luckily it always converges, always. So that's great. And it converges to the solution of the differential equation. Okay? So we have an exponential representation of the solution of this differential equation acting linearly on the initial point, transferring it to the final point. If we have linear time varying but scalar, x dot equals a of t times x, x and r. Okay? The 
solution, as you guys know, is just the exponential of the integral of a times x naught. But LTV in general, so uh, x and Rn, this is a of t, the solution is not in general the exponential of the matrix is the integral of your matrix. It's not like this. Okay? So in very, very special cases where A of T is just a function of time times a constant matrix, yes, you can do that. Otherwise, it's not the case. But we have, uh, we know, we know that X of T is, there is some matrix, it's linear, of course, acting on X naught. It's a linear map, we know that. The state transition matrix. Luckily, due to the Piano Baker series, provides actually a series solution for the phi. It's identity plus the integral of your matrix plus the double of the iterated integral, 0 to tau 1 now, a of tau 1, a of tau 2, right? d tau 2, d tau 1, and so on. So it's an infinite series. Again, it converges to your solution. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so we're done with the linear case. Whether it's time invariant or time varying, we have a, here we have a strictly exponential representation here, we have an exponential-like thing. Okay? So we want to extend this to non-linear case. So now we're talking about nonlinear time invariant. So x dot is f of x. Okay? And this has been tackled before, by the way. This paper is 1978. Okay, I wrote it. This has been tackled before, so at least I know that I'm aware of the paper of Brobner, 1976. There might be something before. I don't know, but at least this is this was before the chronological calculus. And there is the Fleece paper that is more famous, but it's after. I'm not sure if the Fleece paper cited the chronological calculus or not. It might be, you know, isolated, and it's around the same time frame, too. But Fleece paper cited Grobner. So this is a time invariant which we call autonomous, okay? We have an exponential representation. I wrote it before in this class, if you remember. We have an exponential representation. But I want to emphasize uh, something here. The exponential representation, when, when it was written for this system, it, not, it was not written, actually, like this. So uh, x of t is equal to exponential of f times x naught. You can write it like this, but the main idea was not on the evolution of the initial point. The main idea is on the evolution of an observable, an output function. So if I have an output function y equals some h of x, h in c infinity m. Okay? So if you actually write down the differential equation for this guy, what would be? It's y dot, which is h dot. So it's partial h, partial x, times x dot, correct? Mm -hmm. So this is partial h, partial t, on the left-hand side, equals partial h, partial x, times f, which is a function of x. This is what? This is what? Uh, That's right, the right-hand side is a lead derivative L, L, h along f. That's right. But what is this when you see it as an equation? But, uh, we can't say that partial h or partial... I, I, it looks like a partial differential equation. It is. But this is not partial h by partial t because h is a function of x only, right? Yeah, but h as a function of x evolves over time under the system dynamics. I mean partial h by partial t is equal to zero. No. h evolves with time. 
So it has a total derivative dh by dt. This is zero, okay. No, this is not zero. This is equal to the no to the right hand side. H is a function of x, right? Yes. Say it's x one squared. Mm -hmm. X one evolves on time, so x one squared evolves on time, right? So h from this equation, h evolves actually according to this linear PDE. We now manage to write the nonlinear ODE x dot equals f of x as a linear PDE. This is the idea of Kuhlman, 1930 something. This is the problem. Now we have the operator f acts on an infinite dimension the space. The space of functions. Here it was acting on a finite dimension Rn or something, or Mn. When you view it this way, this is a linear, but it's PDE. So when we write down the exponential representation, we actually write it on the evolution of h, not x naught. No. At the end of the day, you can come and say, well, h is just x. We'll do it now. But when we write down this, we actually write it for y. So this is h acting, and this is evaluated by x naught. So uh, this is what, if you remember, this was identity plus, this is exponential f t, force. Identity plus ft plus f squared, which is f acting on f t squared here, and so on. So, this is all acting on h evaluated at x naught. This makes sense now, why? Because this f squared or whatever, f acts on a C infinity function, it gives you the D derivative, that's fine and very well defined. So this fh, this term, f acting on h is nothing but the D derivative of h along f. And now f acting on fh is also fine. Because it's the D derivative, D derivative of h. So this is very well defined. And you just evaluated the initial. And you can also say, that's fine, I can do it on scalar by scalar. My first output is just x1, and get how x1 evolves, that's fine. And yn, get how y, n, which is xn, evolves, that's fine. In this case, the f acting on f, on all these edges, is nothing but partial f, partial the x's times f. And when you do it the next time, it's partial this guy, partial x times the f, and so on and so forth. So this is the way we define the exponential. Okay? So our f squared term kind of thing is not really square. We cannot square a vector field to get a vector, right? But it's, uh, it's f acting on f. And then f cube is f acting on f squared, and so on and so forth. Okay? And we know how a vector acting on, you know, vector acting on a function and a vector acting on the resulting function and so on. Or if you like, this way, okay, we know how a vector acting on a vector, you know, on the back of our mind we know that it's actually acting on each function separately. But a vector acting on a vector is just partial f, partial x times f. A vector again acting on, a, on you know, so this is now f squared, and if I have f cube, it's f acting on f squared. So it's partial this guy, which is f squared partial x times f, and so on and so forth. Any, any questions so far? Uh, exponential of f, d, f is just a vector, right? Yes. So this so, is, we now are defining this, so, we're denoting it by an exponential. Okay, so exponential f, d, will it be a vector or a matrix? This is a... That's a good question. This is a vector. I mean, exponential ft? Exponential ft is a vector, yes. So, acting on h, which is also a vector. Right? No, h is a function. Right? Okay. h is the same thing as function. Yes. But you can do it for... So here, this is like, I'm my first h, I do it and I'm done. In the second, third, and so on. So, if you do it this way, Lump together, okay. You can write down the solution of the entire differential equation if you like. 
Any questions so far? Okay, so uh, this is again nonlinear time invariant. The chronological calculus is to generalize this idea. So now we have nonlinear time varying. So we have x dot equals f of t and x. And you can get the same result here actually, by the way, by writing down the Taylor series expansion. Without going to this idea, and you know, if you like to work on Rn, you can do the Taylor series expansion and it will work just fine. But here we cannot actually, for the time value case, because it will require differentiability with respect to time, which sometimes we don't have. But, so we'll do the same here. We'll do the same. We have output function that it's a function of x. So this is c infinity n, any small function, that's fine. Maybe x1, x1 squared, whatever. So uh, I would want to know how this function evolves with time. So uh, here is the point. So we, at the end of the day, we want to write something like y of t, right? It's some operator, let's give it a name, I don't know. Maybe, what, do you have a name? Maybe P, T, acting on H evaluated at X naught, right? So this is what we're looking for, we don't know it yet. And PT should be an exponential-like series, okay? This is what we're looking for. This is the idea of chronological calculus. So like I said, this is this is Grobner, 1976, for an autonomous vector field. Fleece in 1983, he added the effect of inputs, which is a very uh, you know interesting result. So f plus g1 u1, g2 u2, and so on and so, and gives you this series in terms of lead derivatives. This is lead derivatives indeed, right? F acting on h is the lead derivative gives you this series in terms of lead derivatives along f and g's and integrals of the u's okay. this is the fleece here is the generic case chronological calculus 1978 like I said and the chair of the lids the idea is super simple it's nothing uh, nothing complicated at all y dot partial h partial t is partial f partial x I'm sorry, partial h, partial x. x dot, right? Which is, like we said, this is L, F, H, or F, act 